Welcome to this session on OAuth and OpenID Connect for single page applications. So that introduction was really, really nice. Um, cool to see all these different approaches to development. And I really like the guy, the guy uh, Shake. So that was the perfect introduction. Since you're sitting at home, nobody can see you, nobody can judge you. So uh, grab that cocktail and follow along for this ride on OAuth and OpenID Connect in single page applications. Before we start, I want to set the scene a bit. Um, I know, well, at here at least in Belgium, it's, it's about lunchtime, so I'm a little bit hungry, um, but I'm also a big fan of food and fancy food and cooking, which is why I chose Restograde of one of my training applications. Restograde is something you're all familiar with. It's an application where you can post restaurant reviews and find the next best hotspot in your neighborhood, at least the, uh, once you're allowed to go there again in the future when this whole pandemic thing has kind of ended. But what really matters is it's an application backed by a bunch of APIs and services with a front-end application and a mobile app and so on and so on. That by itself is not that special. That's how almost every application today has been set up or built. What's a bit more special or uh, what's a bit more interesting is the fact that they also expose their APIs to third partner websites. So Restograde as the application, they have a bunch of APIs and they want other applications to use those APIs and that data to build their own solutions around the Restograde ecosystem. And that's what you see in a lot of places today where you can use APIs like GitHub's APIs to build your own uh, tooling and pipelines and so on and so on. And you'll find that everywhere. And that's the perfect premise for what we want to talk about here today. Not delicious food, unfortunately, but um, something a little bit more dry, but also pretty interesting, and that's OAuth and OpenID Connect. In an OAuth and OIDC world, you'll have typically have a bunch of clients trying to access certain APIs. Um, usually we don't talk about one client, but you have a mobile client. You may have a backend web application uh, doing certain things. You may even have software-based clients without any users involved. Of course, you typically don't have one API anymore today. You have a bunch of APIs deployed in various mechanisms. Uh, that doesn't matter too much for what, what's going on right here. In an OAuth and OIDC world, all of the interaction here is going to be governed by one central entity called the security token service. And your security token service is basically the one making decisions and approving certain um, interactions from happening, very implicitly, as we'll see in a second. So a client will go to the security token service and ask like, hey, I need to know who the user is. Can you authenticate the user for me and provide me with a bit of information about that user? That aspect would be OpenID Connect. That's essentially offloading authentication to a central service and retrieving that information in return. A client can also ask the security token service like, hey, I want to talk to this API. Do you think that's okay? And can you provide me with a token that represents that authority, please? And that's OAuth, that question. We'll see in, in a couple of slides that this question is actually a lot more complicated than just a single arrow, but just keep it simple for now. And we kindly ask that to the SDS. Once the SDS says like, yeah, sure, of course, here's a token, you can now access the API. The client can make API calls with what we call an access token. That's an OAuth 2 security token that represents the authority of the client to call the API, sometimes on behalf of the user, sometimes on behalf of the client. And then the final piece of the puzzle here is the API itself. They need to verify that access. They need to determine is this actually allowed, yes or no, and they can use information from the security token service there. This may be very implicit or very explicit. Um, implicit would be verifying that token and trusting the information. Explicitly would be going to the SDS and asking about this token, like what does this mean? Can I do this, yes or no? And that again is part of OAuth. So in a, in a quick summary here, OpenID Connect is about authenticating the user to a client, as in giving the client information about the user, and OAuth is about a client accessing an API or another resource with an access token. Here today, we're mainly going to talk about the bottom part of OAuth, how the client obtains a token, and how the client accesses APIs, and of course, some token security challenges in front-end web applications. If you talked or if you heard about OAuth and OpenID Connect before, you may notice that I'm not using the correct terminology, and there's a very good reason for that. And the main reason is that if you look at OAuth specs and OpenID Connect specs, you'll see that they both have different terms for the same thing. In an OAuth spec, the user is called a resource owner, and in OIDC, it's going to be the end user. And if I have to switch between terms uh, throughout the presentation, everybody is going to be confused, uh, which is why I choose to use a common set of terminology, as you can see in the left column. So whenever I talk about an API, 
in an OAuth spec, it would be the resource server, which in practice is most of the times an API anyway. All right, with that out of the way, let me quickly say a word about myself. Um, we already had a very nice introduction, so thank you for that. I am Philippe Dreck, I'm from Belgium. I used to travel the world to help people uh, build more secure applications, and now I get uh, the fortune from doing that uh, from um, in my home along with my family, which is definitely something else. I'm running Pragmatic Web Security, which is basically my own company where I, uh, through which I help people with training and courses and uh, consulting and stuff like that. I'm a Google developer expert, which uh, is a recognition by Google for uh, all the work I've been doing for the community, the resources, the presentations, and the same thing from Art Zero as an ambassador there as well. If you need to know more about me, there's a website um, that I that contains a lot more, so you can go there and read all of that, um, and that basically tells you everything you need to know about me. Enough about me, let's talk about front-end applications and OAuth and OIDC. Remember this one arrow where the front end was trying to get some tokens from the security token service and I said like, yeah, it's not that simple. Well, uh, I'm going to show you why it's not that simple. Let's start with the traditional flow for getting the access token from the security token service. And that flow is known as the implicit flow. In the implicit flow, the front end uh, relies on the browser to go to the security token server ser service. Sorry. So the front end is basically redirecting the browser of the user to the STS with certain parameters in the URL to tell the STS, I would like to obtain a token to access this API. And the browser of the user is going to navigate to restrogate.com in this case, that's my example application. And that security token service is going to um, look at the request and it has no idea who the user is. So it's gonna prompt the user for authentication. The user is like, oh yeah, I am Philippe and my password is uh, Belgian beer is pretty awesome. So here we go. And you authentic and user authenticates to the security token service. This is just a web form being submitted and so on. You know how this goes. If there's multi-factor authentication, this would be the moment to enforce that as well, and so on and so on. Then there's an optional authorization step. So the security token service can ask the user, do you really want this front-end application to access that API in your name? This is really important in third-party scenarios, and the user in this case authorizes that. Now the STS, the security token service, has the information it needs, so it will return a token, an access token, through the browser in another redirect, which will trigger the loading of the front-end application. So basically the STS sends the flow back to the front-end, the front-end reloads, reads the URL, sees like, oh, there's an access token in the URL, and extracts that token from that URL. With that token, the front-end can now go to the API and make an API call. This is, if it's a REST API, it's going to be a GET, a POST, PUT, PATCH, LEAD, doesn't matter, and the API will process the token, authorize the request, and send a proper response in return. This is how JavaScript-based front-end web applications have been doing OAuth for about eight, uh, seven to eight years. There are a few drawbacks here. Um, one of the major drawbacks is the fact that this access token, which gives access to an API, which represents the authority to access an API, is sent over an insecure front channel. It's sent in a URL through the browser, and sending data in URLs is not the best security practice. It, it has a tendency to leak. If you copy the URL, uh, the token will be in there as well, and there's all kinds of problems here. So security people have a, a dislike for the implicit flow, but there's no real alternative, or there used to be no alternative. This was what you had, and that's what we had to do it with. As a consequence, the implicit flow only supports access tokens. It doesn't support refresh tokens, which give long-term access. More on that in a second. So yeah, the implicit flow, not great, but it works, um, and people have been using this in practice. So, uh, so far, so good. What changed now is that about a year and a half ago, a few very smart people said, you know what, enough is enough. Let's not do this anymore and let's come up with a better alternative. And that better alternative is a repurpose of the authorization code flow, the flow for backend web applications, but with some modifications so it can be used in frontend web applications. And this flow has better security properties. It's again, not perfect, we'll talk about that later, but it's better. And let's take a look at how that works in practice. The general idea will remain the same, but we'll add a few more steps to make sure that we can use this flow in a front-end application. One of the first steps here is to use a secret, which we call the code verifier, and the hash of that secret, which we call the code challenge. These are very fancy words for saying that the, the, the client is generating a one-time password. 
And with the hash of that one-time password, it's basically telling the STS upfront, like, hey, I know a secret. I'm not telling you what the secret is, but I'm proving you that I know the secret, and I'll tell you the secret later. That's basically what's going on. So we do that. We store that code verifier somewhere, and we start the flow again. We open restrogate.com. Now we have additional parameters in the URL, and the flow goes to the security token service again, just like before. Notice that this code challenge, this hash value is present. The hash value itself is meaningless until, uh, until step eight, so don't worry about that. We just continue the flow, authenticate user, authorize that request if necessary, and if everything checks out, we, the security token service stores this hash value along with an authorization code. It generates this authorization code and stores it along with this challenge. The authorization code is now sent back to the client. Not an access token, but an authorization code. A completely different piece of information is sent through the URL to the front-end application. All right, this, there's the same number of steps as we had in the implicit flow. Now we need two more. The first one is going back to the security token service. The front-end is gonna make a JavaScript-based API call to a token endpoint at the security token service to exchange that code for tokens. Remember, we used to get the access token in the URL. Now we only get a code, and that code needs to be exchanged for tokens in step 11. And if everything checks out, then we actually get the result in step 13. In step 11, the client provides this code verifier, this one-time password, the secret to the security token service. The client basically tells the STS like, hey, you know what? I, I said I knew a secret. Here's that secret that I knew up front and that will match the hash that you had received in step three. So now the security token service recalculates the hash on the secret, compares it to the one it has stored in step eight, and sees like, oh yeah, you actually knew that secret in step two and three, awesome. And that tells the STS one important piece of information. It's the same client exchanging the code. It's not somebody that, the case that somebody stole the code and is trying to exchange it for tokens. No, it's the same client because it's running in the same browser where that secret has been stored in step number one. And of course, with that token, the front end can access the API uh, as it did before. All right, this is a current best practice. This is what you should be using today because this flow has better security properties. I'll, I've listed a few for you uh, so you can look at this later if you uh, prefer. First and uh, foremost, the code verifier and code challenge act as a client authentication mechanism to ensure that the same client is running the full flow. This preserves the integrity of the flow. This avoids uh, attackers from stealing codes and uh, trying to exchange them or uh, giving a fake code to a client and tricking the client into doing something with that fake code. So this is essentially a, a strong or important protection mechanism. We also don't exchange tokens in the front channel anymore. So it's an access, an authorization code and that authorization code is protected. First of all, it's valid for one-time use only and it has a short lifetime. So it's, if it's valid for 10 seconds and you use it once and it's uh, invalid after that, that's a strong protection mechanism. Additionally, you need to know that secret from step one to exchange it in step 11. That's an additional protection mechanism here. And finally, and that's the, the most beautiful part, I would say from a functional perspective, the authorization code flow supports additional tokens. It's allowed to issue refresh tokens in step 13, allowing an application to obtain access tokens for a longer period of time than just one time. And we'll talk about that later as well. So in general, the authorization code flow has better security properties than the implicit flow. What does this look like in practice? I wanna highlight two particular requests here. Um, the first one is the redirect in step two and three. As you can see, this is a long URL containing all the configuration parameters for this OAuth flow. It states that we are expecting an authorization code in the response. That's a response type on line number two. It indicates a client identifier that is a unique ID issued to this front-end application. It also uh, tells the STS where it expects the code to be sent to in step 10, that would be. So that's uh, just additional information there. And it contains this pixie code challenge, the hash of that secret. That's the hash that the security token service stores in step number eight. All right. The second thing I want to highlight is request number 11. At step 11, we are exchanging an authorization code that we obtained in step 10, and we want tokens in return. 
and we're telling the security token service like, hey, I'm running an authorization code grant type. That means I'm giving you an authorization code and I expect you to give me something else in return. By the way, I am this particular client. I got this uh, code on this particular URL and here's the code that I've received before. Please exchange that for tokens in this case. And by the way, you know, I proved to you that I knew a secret. Well, here is that secret value. This is the value that I used to calculate the hash, the code challenge. And now I'm proving to you that I knew that value, that I possess that value. And that's essentially how the authorization code flow with Pixie, with proof key for code exchange works in practice. This is what every front-end application should be using today, more or less. You can see that there's a whole lot of steps in this OAuth flow. If you want to dig deeper, um, I've built an application for my training courses uh, where you can simulate OAuth flows. So it basically uh, allows you to see all of these steps and it gives you um, step-by-step -step explanations of what's happening, allowing you to visualize all of these steps. Because in a real application, everything will happen behind the scenes. You won't see much, but here you can visualize all the steps with all the different values and parameters and so on and so on. So if you're interested in um, exploring OAuth flows, you should go to flowsimulator.pragmaticwebsecurity.com and you can play around with your own uh, clients and security token services and so on and so on. All right. This is, this conference is called Dev Day. It's not uh, PowerPoint Slides Day. So I, I assume you also want to see some code. Um, I'm not going to switch to a live code editor, but I have some PowerPoint code for you to show you how to implement all of this in an Angular application. I'll do React in the next slide and generic JavaScript in the slide after that. The beautiful part of my job, it used to be like very complicated, like here's a detail you have to take into account and you have to do this correct and then that and then that. And now it's like, yeah, just pick a library. Oh, you're using Out0 as a security token service. Awesome. Here's the Out0 Angular SDK. You configure it like, oh, my STS tenant is running on this domain and here's the client identifier, done integrated and from that point on you have um, a login function like if the user clicks the login button you call this dot out the login with redirect and you're done so as far as implementation effort goes this is absolutely awesome this allows you to implement all of these comp complex flows with all the security requirements that you need to take into account with a single line of code and two lines of configuration if you're not doing angular um I would say I disagree, but that's a different story. No, if you're doing React, that's also a perfectly valid approach. Um, it's the same thing, just in React terminology. So there's a React SDK from Out0 as well. Um, you configure it with the necessary parameters, and then you wrap your application in this Out0 provider. And that exposes the necessary hooks. So function-specific hooks are available to call this login with redirect if you want to, or log out, or to get a new access token, and so on. And if you're not doing any of these, if you're doing um, something else or just plain JavaScript. There's also a generic uh, JavaScript SDK um, for uh, running this yourself. So it's the same principle. You configure it and you call the necessary functions and this will work perfectly with an out zero security token service. There are also, there's a bunch of libraries available. Um, there's uh, vendor agnostic libraries. Um, for example, there's Angular libraries that work with uh, all other services as well. So you can find a library for the language you're working in and the, the security token service you're using. So there's plenty of options here. My advice is to always use a library. Don't start implementing this yourself, just use a library because that's the right way of doing things. That brings us to a first takeaway here. The implicit flow is deprecated in favor of the authorization code flow with Pixie. So both um, the security best practices for OAuth from a year and a half ago deprecate the implicit flow and OAuth 2.1 will also deprecate the flow when the spec becomes final. So the implicit flow is out. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that the implicit flow is on fire, basically. There's no new vulnerabilities. The implicit flow is not more vulnerable than before. It's just that we have a better alternative now. So we should use the better alternative whenever we have the chance. So concretely, this means if you're building a new project, you use the authorization code flow with Pixie, no excuses. If you have a legacy application, well, legacy, if you have an application from a year and a half ago, um, that's, um, that's still using the implicit flow, there's no need to burn it down and uh, change that immediately after this session. But keep in mind that you probably should be upgrading to the authorization code flow with Pixie in the coming six months to a year. That should be on the roadmap, but it's not absolutely urgent because the implicit flow is not inherently broken. 
it's just a bit less secure than this authorization code flow with Bixi. All right, that's the first part. Let's dive into the second part. What if an access token expires? So we have this access token giving us access to APIs and that thing has a lifetime. Maybe it's valid for 10 minutes. So what happens after 10 minutes? Well, the API will be like, yeah, nice try front end, go away, this is no longer valid. So you need to get a new access token at that point. Getting a new access token used to be very complicated with iframe based flows and cookies going around and stuff like that. But now we have the authorization code flow with Pixie giving us a refresh token. And with a refresh token, we can run a refresh token flow. And that means the following. The front end has an access token and a refresh token. And when the access token actually expires or is about to expire, we can monitor the lifetime. The front end goes back to the security token service with that refresh token. And it's going to be like, hey, can I get a new access token, please? And the security token service will be like, hmm, let me check that refresh token. Like, oh yeah, this is indeed valid and you're indeed that front end client. That's, that's cool. Here you go. And it issues a new access token and a new refresh token. And that new access token is valid for 10 minutes again, allowing the front end to go to the API, make its calls, get a response and be very happy essentially. And 10 minutes later, the same eating happens again. It goes to the security token service, like can I get a new access token and so on and so on until that refresh token expires. So in this setup, you would give the access token a lifetime of five to 10 minutes and the refresh token a lifetime of eight hours, five days, whatever works for your application. And if the refresh token expires, then of course we run a new authorization code flow with Pixie to obtain fresh tokens and the whole thing starts over again and again and again. Awesome, right? Well, yes, pretty awesome. But keep in mind that we're building web applications. So what if this front-end application has a security issue? What if an attacker injects a piece of malicious JavaScript and manages to steal our tokens from the, uh, the, from the front-end, from the single-page application? Well, the access token is not very valuable because it expires after five to 10 minutes. So yes, you can post crap on my Twitter feed for five minutes and then you're out. But that refresh token might be valid for eight hours or five days or a year, which you shouldn't do, but you know how things are. So that's my that's maybe a problem. So where does this JavaScript come from? What about malicious JavaScript? Well, you have all kinds of ways to trigger the execution of malicious JavaScript in an application. For example, if you obtain user provided data from an API, a restaurant review, and it contains a snippet of script code, and you inject that into the page in an insecure way, which is easier in React than in Angular, but that's again a different story. You have a cross-site scripting problem. That code now executes in your application. You can pull in remote code, like, oh yeah, here's a service provider with a chat widget, and I'm just pulling in that code, and they get compromised, which has happened in the past. Just ask Ticketmaster, who got like a 1.2 million pound fine for loading a compromised file from a third-party provider. That is not a joke, happens in practice. Of course, you have uh, external content on your web page. So a lot of applications pull in advertisements. Advertisements can contain malicious code as well. And finally, you can even deploy your application with a malicious third-party dependency embedded right into the app, um, which is also a very, very common attack vector. And all of these threats have one thing in common. Once the code is pulled in, it runs in your application. It has full access to anything your application has access to, including potentially refresh tokens. If these tokens live in a browser, that malicious code can just reach in, read it, and send it off somewhere else. And then the attacker is like, oh, I have a refresh token, awesome. What can I do with that? Well, I can get access tokens for the next eight hours, boom. That's gonna be a lot of crap on your Twitter feed for eight hours. Might explain why we see so many tweets from high ranked people that look like crap. No, that's a joke. <laughs> this is a risk that the OAuth uh, specifications address. So this is not um, a big shock. This is not a big surprise. Uh, the fact that tokens are hard to secure is well known, which is why the advice used to be don't use refresh tokens in the browser. That advice has changed now. That advice has become you can use them, but only if you apply additional protection. And that additional protection is called refresh token rotation. And it basically means that refresh tokens become one time use only. Let me show you what that means. Here's a fancy timeline. 
you can see I'm a PowerPoint wizard, so uh, that's pretty useful in this case. Um, helps if you build thousands of slides, so uh, sure, you get used to it after a while. What happens here? Well, the application obtains tokens using the authorization code flow with Pixie, and it receives AT1, which is access token one, and RT1, which is refresh token one. Access token one expires after a certain amount of time, let's say 10 minutes. So the application knows that like, hey, this token is valid for 10 minutes, so it sets a timer for nine minutes. And after nine minutes, the application is like, aha, I'm gonna preemptively refresh my tokens. So I'm gonna run a refresh token flow using refresh token one, and if everything works out, I will receive AT2, access token two, and RT2, which is refresh token two. And the same thing starts over again, like valid for 10 minutes, we're gonna set a timer for nine. And we're gonna use refresh token two to obtain token set three, timer for nine minutes, and we're gonna use refresh token three to obtain token set four, and this just keeps going and going and going. This mechanism is called refresh token rotation because essentially every time we use a refresh token, we also get a new one for next time. And this has been introduced in the OAuth 2 for browser-based apps specification and will be part of the OAuth 2.1 spec when it's finished as well. This is, I would say, recommendatory, but I need to check the wording in the spec, but this is something you must implement for front-end applications. No questions about it. What does it look like on the request level? Well, here's a request to exchange a refresh token for new tokens. So we send a post request to the STS. It contains the refresh token um, that we obtained before in line five and the grant type on line three is the refresh token grant here. The response to this request will be a request with an access token, a new expiration date on line four and a new refresh token on line five. This refresh token is the one you use next time you make a request to the token endpoint with a refresh token and you get a new one and so on and so on. That's refresh token rotation because we're basically rotating our refresh token every time we use it. Refresh token rotation by itself is useless. As in, yeah, we rotate that, but if the attacker steals it and they can use it, then what good does this whole thing do us, right? Well, that's because refresh token rotation is only the first part of the puzzle. The SDS, the implementation of the security token service, will also detect potential abuse cases. Let's look at an example. First case here, the application is doing what it normally does. That's the blue uh, lines on top here. The attacker has a way to steal the refresh token. So uh, all of a sudden the application renders a, a review containing malicious code, executes that code, and that code results in theft of the refresh token. Potentially a big problem. The attacker now uses that refresh token to obtain access token tree and refresh token tree. The security token service has no idea that it's not the legitimate application making that call, but the attacker. And that's why it just complies. Oh, here's a refresh token. I'll give you new tokens and so on. So far, not good. However, after nine minutes after the application has received access token two, the application will be like, hold on, it's time to get my new tokens and it will use refresh token two. And at that point, the security token service will look at its database and see like, but you already used refresh token. That doesn't make sense. Why would you do that? I gave you RT3 and not RT2. And at that point, the, the security token service assumes that something really bad has happened. Alarm bells start to go off and it basically revokes refresh token tree and all associated tokens. So th the moment the attacker tries to use refresh token tree in this scenario, it will no longer work because the token chain has been revoked, declared as invalid. That's what basically detection of abuse is all about. Of course, this also works the other way around. So if the application, the attacker steals refresh token two, the application uses it first, but then the attacker tries to do it afterwards, the refresh token, so the security token service will detect that as well, because again, RT2 is used one time by the application and one time by the attacker. And that basically tells the security token service like, hold on, this is not good. We should stop right here, right now. And again, all the tokens associated with this token chain are revoked and both the application and the attacker lose access. Of course, the application can recover from that by running a new authorization code flow with Pixie and the attacker is basically out of luck and can no longer get fresh tokens. Of course, until they steal a new token again, but that's a different story. Awesome, right? 
like this adds refresh token uh, security in the browser. So now we can have both refresh tokens and access tokens and everybody is happy because everything is secure. Well, we still have some time left, so you're probably guessing that the answer is like, no, not really. It's it helps, but not really. It's it makes abuse of a refresh token a bit harder. That's true. But it sidesteps or it ignores the root of the problem here that the attacker is running malicious code in your application. The attacker has control over what the code of your application does in the browser of the user. So let me show you two scenarios of how the attacker can abuse that level of access to screw up the life of the application and the user, essentially. So here's the browser running the application app.restrograde.com. And at some point, malicious JavaScript code executes in this context. At this point, that code can do whatever it wants to do. Whatever your application can do, this code can do. So what it can it do? It could monitor the application for refresh tokens. Like, oh, you're requesting new tokens. That's awesome. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna listen in here. I'm gonna read that token. Awesome. Hmm. I'm gonna send it to my server. So the application is requesting new tokens, running a refresh token flow, gets a new access token, a new refresh token, and the malicious code, the red code, just reads it and ships it off. Like, oh yeah, I'm gonna send this away to my server. Just keep keep an eye on it. And this keeps going and going and going until the user closes the application. Until the application is closed, there's an unclosed handler in the malicious code here. And at that point, the attacker knows that the user has closed the application, that the application is no longer active. But the refresh tokens might still be active and the application is not gonna use them. So at this point, the attacker can go to the security token service and use the latest refresh token it observed and steal or obtain valid access tokens. And the attacker can keep doing that as long as the application does not use one of these refresh tokens. But since it's closed, chances are the application will never use this again, which gives the attacker access in the name of the application and in the name of the user in this case. You can do the same pattern with access tokens. So uh, for the record, um, many good SDKs like Auth0's SDK, they hide the refresh token in a service worker. So you can't do this in practice, but you can do the same with access tokens. So the application can um, monitor the the, uh, the, the the sorry the malicious code can monitor the legitimate application, and even though the refresh token is hidden, the access token is always exposed to JavaScript because it needs to be used in JavaScript. So basically, the malicious code can extract access tokens um, because they're always accessible. There's no a practical way to hide them and ship them off to a server and start using them. This requires an online attack, as in this uh, needs the malicious sorry, the malicious code needs to continuously monitor the uh, running application and siphon off access tokens. But as long as the application is doing this refresh pattern, the malicious code will be able to steal access tokens. If you want to know more, um, I wrote an article about how this works in practice. Um, it's uh, I wouldn't say very advanced JavaScript attack, but it takes some uh, JavaScript internal knowledge to make this work. But this is perfectly possible. That's not good, right? So basically we're screwed. So whatever we do, even with refresh token rotation, there's various ways for a client to attack token storage in the browser. And there's a very good reason that the advice has been for a very long time, don't put refresh tokens in the browser because we are actually screwed. I'm a web security expert and honestly, there's no practical way to secure tokens in the browser. Yes, you can do it, but there's always gonna be this risk. And that risk has always been there. It's just that um, it takes a bit of effort to run such an attack. But for a sensitive application, for a truly sensitive application handling financials, healthcare information, stuff like that, I would say that this risk is unacceptable. This is not the way things are supposed to go. And this poses too many security issues for such an application. So don't put tokens in the browser. That would be a good solution, right? What if you just keep tokens out of the browser altogether? That makes everybody happy. Well. Most people, except like the web developer, they're like, but I need my tokens. Well, yes and no. Let me introduce you a one final concept in this session, and that's a backend for frontend. A backend for frontend does exactly that. It keeps tokens out of the browser. So instead of your frontend communicating directly with the security token service, we now build a small backend. And that backend doesn't do anything useful except for two things. It runs an OAuth flow, and it forwards requests to an API. 
So the RestoGrade application, the RestoGrade frontend, now becomes a frontend with a tiny backend, basically kind of a reverse proxy setup. That's uh, uh, one way of putting this. Between the frontend and the backend, we maintain a session, which in most cases, since it's a browser app, is going to be a cookie-based session. Very simple, very straightforward. Just a cookie. Cookies can be somewhat protected against abuse, so that's a good uh, use case here. The backend becomes our OAuth client application. So instead of the frontend running these flows, the backend will run these flows. And that's relevant because backend clients in OAuth, they can use much better security properties. They have awesome security properties. So the backend will interact with the security token service, running an authorization code flow with proper client authentication, key-based authentication, even MTLS, something like that. And the security token service issues tokens to the backend. Whenever the backend or the frontend makes an API call, it sends that call to the backend, like, hey, I want to get reviews, and the backend will take that call and forward that to the API with proper access tokens. And the API can now respond uh, to that with a response, which makes it back to the frontend, and everybody's happy. And the reason that this pattern is absolutely amazing is because the security best practices for clients running on a server, a backend system, are much better. We can use client authentication. We can use sender constraint tokens. And that backend sees all your front end traffic, so you can even implement anomaly detection patterns and uh, prevent brute force attacks when a token is abused, and so on and so on. So this gives you a lot more control and a lot better security properties. So how does this work in practice? Well, let me show you how the flow changes, because in, in a nutshell, it's the same setup, just a few um, moving parts uh, switch sides, basically. So let me run you through a flow. The user still interacts with the RestoGrade application. The user still asks the frontend to log in, click on the login button. The frontend will trigger a login on the backend, like sends a request to the BFF, like, hey, you should probably run a login flow, which is openly connect, and get some tokens as well so we can access APIs after that. So the BFF runs an OAuth flow. This is the authorization code flow, just like we've seen before, this long URL with all the parameters, which will navigate the user's browsers, browser to the security token service, just like before. The user authenticates and authorizes the client to access APIs on their behalf. That's the four steps we had before, just one line to keep it a, lit, a bit lighter here. If everything checks out, the security token service redirects the browser back to the PFF with an authorization code, which will load a callback handler on the backend system. And that callback handler extracts the authorization code from the URL and exchanges it for tokens with client authentication. So it basically has to provide client credentials, hopefully a key-based authentication, which is really strong, to the SDS proving that it's a legitimate backend. And if everything works out, it receives the tokens from the security token service. So now the RestoGrade BFF knows that you're Philip, um, that Philip has authenticated and it has tokens to access the API. So first of all, it authenticates the user, it marks the user as authenticated and relays some user information to the frontend. It establishes a session, which can be any type of session you want, server side, client side, that doesn't matter uh, much in this scenario. And that session contains the necessary token information. All right, that's the setup. Now we have established tokens in our PFF and the frontend has a session. So now we can start doing useful things like API calls. The frontend makes an API call to the BFF, like restogate.com slash reviews, done. The call contains a cookie, the browser adds that cookie automatically, allowing the BFF to look up that user session in step 13 and gra grab the tokens for that user, the access token. And now the BFF will make a call to api.restogate.com slash reviews with that access token. And the API hasn't changed here. The API does what it did before. It's like access token. Oh, let's, let me extract the information, decide if this is allowed and give a response in return. So the API doesn't change. It's just the frontend that sends the call to a backend for frontend, the BFF instead of an API. And the BFF translates that request in the middle. This pattern is extremely powerful. There are some pros and cons. And one of the drawbacks is, yes, you have to build a small backend but that backend doesn't do anything. There's no business logic on that backend. It just forwards calls to APIs with tokens. That's it. This is like literally maybe not even a hundred lines of code if you write this correctly. Awesome. But you get with that hundred lines of code, you get much better security properties. You get 
Uh, you get to keep tokens out of the browser. You get to hide uh, sensitive information. You get control over which requests are allowed. You can implement all kinds of security measures. So this is highly recommended. Sensitive applications, sensitive frontends should consider using a BFF, and this should be, in my opinion, the only proper way. This is the only proper way of implementing a single page application with sensitive features. All right, let me give you a couple of key takeaways here. Use the authorization code flow with Pixie over the implicit flow. Again, the implicit flow is not inherently broken. It's just less ideal than the authorization code flow. So prefer that one over the implicit flow. If somebody tries to scare you in like a, a pen test report or an audit, like oh, the implicit flow is deprecated. Now you know what it really means. Yes, you shouldn't use it anymore, but it's not like you can't use it. It's not like it's more vulnerable than it was a year ago or two years ago. It's still the same crap that we knew then still applies today. Use short access token lifetimes. Literally five to 10 minutes is a good recommendation for front-end web applications. Keep in mind, front-ends are not that secure. There's always security issues in a front-end, so keep lifetimes short. Use refresh tokens with refresh token rotation. For a non-sensitive app, this is as good as it gets. This, is, this gives you everything you need in a very easy, lightweight manner, so please use that for non-sensitive apps. And for sensitive apps, consider deploying this BFF pattern, which gives you much more control, gives you much better security properties, and is something you should be handling in a backend piece of code, not in a front end piece of code. If this blows your mind, like, holy crap, OAuth is complicated, I fully agree, which is why I built an online course, a three part online course about OAuth and OpenID Connect. There's a free overview introduction and then Two modules dive deeper into single page applications and API security with OAuth and OIDC. There's a nice discount for uh, Dev Day especially, so if you want to um, take advantage of that, please be my guest and go there, and uh, you'll have a lot of fun learning about OAuth and OIDC using, uh, among other things, the flow simulator to figure out the exact details of the different flows. With that, I want to thank you for watching. If you want to um, know more about security i recommend connecting with me on twitter or linkedin if you have any needs for training reach out um, we can still do training this year if you want to or we can schedule it in for next year and if you have um, the need to understand these things better or need someone to advise you in which direction to take you can reach out as well and we can discuss what's possible and if i'm not mistaken we have some time for questions now so if you ask some questions in the chat um, i'm sure somebody will uh, query me to get a proper response. I hope you enjoy uh, it. Yeah. Yes, Philip, uh, we have received quite a few questions. Uh, so what would you prefer? Shall I read them to you or uh, are you going to read them yourself by scrolling um, through the chat? No, it's it's probably easier if you if you um, post, post the questions to me. That, that way you can uh, choose your favorites uh, amongst others and it will give people a nice uh, Q&A interaction experience as well. Okay, um, so Ken is asking if there is a way to increase the validity of access token through configuration or parameters. Um, so you, you can configure the properties of access tokens. So typically you can configure lifetimes um, on the security token service. You can make them short lift, long lift, uh, something like that. What you can also do is, especially for backend uh, clients, is you can start enforcing additional security measures. For example, a backend application can use access tokens that are linked to its specific identity, um, such as a TLS certificate. And then those tokens can only be used um, when that certificate is being used as well. So yes, there are ways to make tokens uh, more secure, but they typically rely on, especially the advanced features, rely on backend clients, not front-end web clients. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what is the difference between SAML, OAuth, and OpenID Connect? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, H for one, SAML is a lot older, um, doesn't make it bad. It's just that SAML was designed for a different time. So I would say that SAML compares to OpenID Connect because they're both mainly about authentication and not necessarily about delegating access to, um, to a client so that they can access an API on behalf of a user. Um, SAML is older, uses different flows and doesn't work that well with um, with front-end applications and mobile apps and something like that. So um, if you have a project 
today and you have to decide, I would say that OIDC should be your de facto standard. If you need to offload authentication, use OpenID Connect. Unless you have legacy systems that depend on SAML, SAML is not insecure, it's still okay to use. Or if you have, of course, a company that's hooked into SAML, then you might want to um, stick to SAML. But you can also delegate OpenID Connect to SAML as well. So there's plenty of configuration options there. They achieve the same thing, SAML and OIDC. It's just a different technology. One is heavily XML based, SAML, and one is heavily JSON based, which is OpenID Connect. Okay, so next, John, uh, what is the best ground flow for mobile applications? Yeah, that's that's a question I often get. So depends on who you ask. <laughs> if you ask the OAT specifications, then the flow for mobile apps would be the exact same flow that I've shown you today, the authorization code flow with Pixie. A mobile app does this by redirecting the flow to the browser. So if you click login in your mobile app, what typically happens is that um, the mobile app should open up a browser um, or an embedded browser is also fine. Um, and that embedded browser will go to the website of the security token service, allow the user to log in or leverage single sign-on features, and then send that code back to the mobile app. That's the recommended flow um, because users should be taught to log in on trusted websites using their password managers and um, web authentication features, and the application should not be able to handle credentials in this flow. So that's my recommendation. Try to use that one. Uh, but of course, you'll also find custom uh, mobile flows that flows rely that on rely on, uh, that rely on uh, grabbing credentials and sending them to the security token service itself. That's also um, possible, but less recommended. Uh, next, John, um, a person is asking if you have some sample Angular application with authorization code flow, which you could share the link to. In the um, comment section, maybe. Not re well, I, I have one. I have a couple of examples, but um, there's literally, let me scroll back. There's literally nothing more in those examples than um, the code you see here. So, if you want an example Angular application, go look at either this out zero uh, tutorial on how to do this in Angular, which contains these two relevant code snippets. Uh, this is literally everything you need in Angular to make this work. And there's other, if you want to do this in Angular, there's also the Angular OAuth 2 OIDC library from Manfred Steyer. That's a vendor agnostic one. Um, and if you look at their code examples, they have examples running online as well. Um, you'll see that it's the same setup. It's a configuration step, and then it's a using that library step. It's literally as simple as you see here. Okay. Um... So Dalit is asking, what are the best open source identity servers? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, depends on, on what you want to achieve. So you, you'll have different deployment models. So you'll find um, identity servers or uh, security token services ready to go um, as a download package. One example is Keycloak. You can download Keycloak. Uh, it's a Java application, so you start it up, and at that moment, you have a full functioning security token service on your own machine. That's very easy, very straightforward. You'll have um, more elaborate setups, like Glue is one example, G-L-U-U. -U. Um, that one is, is more like an ecosystem, and they have an open source component as well as enterprise options. You'll have identity as a service. That's basically delegating this whole responsibility to someone else, um, like Out0 is an example, Okta, and uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, has Active Directory support for OAuth flows as well. So that's another um, example of how to do this. And then finally, you can um, go with code-based integrations, like libraries that offer all of these flows. And one um, leading example there is Identity Server for the .NET world. So there's plenty of options, open source and non-open source slash commercial. But um, the main differentiator would be how much control you want to have over the solution. Um, me personally, I use Out0 for most of my projects because I don't want to run this myself. I just want to uh, push this to someone else and make it their problem to keep this up and running as it should be. But that's up to you. OK, just a couple more questions, Philip. Uh, they have asked a lot of questions since like your uh, session was really ex uh, interesting to them. Uh, so comparing to Identity Server 4 and Key Cloak, which Identity Server would you recommend? as an identity server? 
Um, well, identity oh. server is a .NET framework. So if you're not using .NET, I would say Keycloak because otherwise you're going to be in a world of pain. Um, it, they take a different approach. So identity server, they're both really good. Um, identity server is uh, gives you a lot more control, um, but it's heavily code oriented. Um, so you configure that through code and so on and so on, which is perfectly fine. Keycloak is more of a, a fully integrated solution and they allow configuration through user interfaces or APIs. So um, I, I think they're both good. They have different needs and different deployment models. So I would say if take a look and, and see for yourself. They both support pretty advanced features and I'm, I use both with customers and, and stuff like that. So both are perfectly fine. Uh, so next down, uh, it's with Lendi one. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, PKC is, uh, sends the access tokens in response to get a post. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, PKC sends the access tokens in response to a post where implicit flow makes a get callback. How does that make PKC more secure? That's that's a good um, comparison. So the trouble. Let me let me go back here. Let me skip to one of the slides from the beginning. Here's that slide of the implicit flow. So the access token here is in the URL. What this means in practice is that um, URLs can be logged. So that's one problem. Um, the access token is actually present in the, the address bar of the browser. So applications have learned to rewrite the history and remove the access token. Because otherwise, if I would copy that URL to send an article to you and it contains my access token, I'm sending my access token to another user, which is not supposed to happen. So these things are not major issues, but they're also not pretty. And the difference is if you move to an authorization code flow, the difference is that uh, in that URL, you only have, I had a slide about that, you only have the authorization code. So you expose less information, but of course the tokens are still sent over the network, but in a more controlled fashion. A post request is um, not as exposed. It's an API call that happens fully in the background. The user typically doesn't even see that. There's nothing to copy paste. There's nothing to rewrite in the URL and so on. So that's why the security properties are a bit better. But you're correct if you um, are thinking now like, yeah, that that's not a world, uh, world change. It's not a, a world of change. It's a small improvement. You're absolutely correct. This is a small improvement. Okay, Philip. Um, so that's it. So we can uh, wrap up the session now. Perfect. Uh, thank you so uh, much. Yeah. Yeah, my, my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the interesting questions. That's awesome to have so many questions to answer. Perfect. Okay, uh, thank you so much for taking your time to answer all of those questions. They were quite a lot. And I also want to uh, thank you especially for offering that discount uh, for your courses for our audience. Uh, thank you so much for that. Yeah, of course, my of pleasure. Course. Um, we kind of have an incentive to do that, right? But <laughs> no, trust me, it's a it's a really good course and it goes into a lot of detail on all these different aspects. So uh, I'm happy to to be able to share that with, with uh, the world and hopefully more and more people understand OAuth and OIDC and will be able to use it correctly and build better and more secure applications.